My name is Sarah and I run the Rocky Mountain School of Photography with my husband Forrest and that's way over in Montana. So we're just here in New York for just a couple days and we're super excited to share some good information with you guys. Um, so first thing, uh, if you missed Forrest's astrophotography lecture, it was pretty awesome. So if you're feeling like getting a little nerdy with your camera, it's the perfect lecture for you. There's a ton of great information there and it was uh, actually saved lives. So if you want to go back on B&H's event space, the event space is awesome. Thank you guys for letting us be here and talk. Uh, we really appreciate it and we hope that you learned some great information today. Um, so uh, I know very little about astrophotography, astrophoto so I'm going to talk about editing style, which is something that I really, really love. Um, but before we hop in, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about how you can stay connected with us if you're interested in knowing more about our school. Uh, we offer a huge variety of courses ranging from one day things. We even have a one day class coming up on Sunday here in this room. Um, it's super awesome. Like all the basics of photography. Uh, we talk a little bit about uh, composition, exposure, editing. We actually have a little shoot together and we walk through things and critique. So it's going to be a really full day. If you're interested, it's only $95, which is awesome. Um, but on top of that, we actually have a six-week summer intensive program, and we even have a year-long professional program if you're making a career out of photography. So we really love what we do, and we love doing it on Mon in Montana, so it's a great place to visit. And um, this year, we're actually celebrating our 30th year as a school, so that's awesome. We're really happy about that. Um, but you can stay in touch with us with these things. If you type in rmsp.tv, you'll get to our YouTube, and rmsp.com is our website. You can look us up on Instagram, too. So. Let's get to it. So for today, what we're going to talk about is a series of things that will really help you guys hone in on what is going to make you a stronger editing style. How many of you guys have worked in Lightroom before? Maybe you've worked on your photos. OK. How many of you have worked in any other programs and you've worked on your photos and maybe gotten them close? They look good, but maybe not quite where you want them to be. Any more hands for that? <laughs> OK. Me too. Uh, so that's why I'm here. I have spent years developing my style, and I still have times where I'm like, why am I doing this? I need to make it better. And that's a good thing. We always want to improve as photographers. If you start thinking you've made it, you never learn anything new. So my goal today is sharing some new things with you guys, as well as mastering some of those older tools that we're already used to. We want to make sure that we're using them properly. So the first thing we're going to talk about today is um, we're actually going to spend a little bit of time on the back end. So what is it that actually makes a good photographic style? So we're going to talk about some questions that you should ask yourself. We're also going to talk about um, some different things that will help you hone in what is it that makes your work unique and how can you bring that out in editing. We're going to review some of Lightroom's editing tools um, and that is the program I'm going to be spending most time in. We're going to talk about perfecting some of the colors, particularly skin tones, how we can work with Lightroom to make some stronger skin tones that actually look accurate, which can be really hard. We're going to demo some unique editing techniques, so using the tools that we have available to actually make some kind of more quirky or um, just particular specific styles. And then we're actually going to talk about how to save it all for later with a preset that works pretty well on a variety of photos. It's easy to make a preset, but it's hard to know exactly which things you should check in that giant box that comes up. And so I'm going to help you guys with that too. So before we get started, I just want to show you a quick example of this is kind of a photo that I've taken. And this is just a super simple edit. And I want you guys to make an edit that you feel like pretty strong about. I really like this one. And this is straight out of the camera on the left and the completed photo on the right. And what I like about this is it brings out all of the things I want to emphasize, like her gorgeous red hair and her lovely skin. And it tones down some of the things that are less important, like the greens in the background are just there to be support. And her shirt is a little bit distracting in the beginning, and I wanted to tone that down a little bit too. So that's the goal with editing, right? We want to strengthen what we have, and we want to eliminate the things that distract us from the main point of the image. So that's what we're working toward. And so. The first thing, I have a little bit of housekeeping before we hop in, and the first one is uh, I am using Adobe Lightroom Classic today. There are multiple versions of Adobe Lightroom. I'm using the Classic version. On top of that, if you haven't used Lightroom, most of the tools that I discussed today are actually available in a variety of editing programs. So even if you're not a Lightroom person, whatever program you're using, you should find tools that look very similar. So don't feel like you won't be able to follow along. Second. 
we're not going to go tool by tool today. Um, I'm going to take a very uh, overarching view of just the tools, like some select tools that I particularly want to focus on. We're not going to talk about the bulk of Lightroom. We're not going to talk about uh, all of the amazing organizational things that it can do for us. We have a bunch of YouTube videos on that on our rmsp.tv if you're interested, but I'm not going to be talking about that today. So this is not a tool by tool day, although I will explain some basics of some tools. Next thing, I'm making a few assumptions. Uh, the first, that you are a photographer. Um, that's awesome. We love photography. I love photography. But even if you're a videographer, this might be useful. If you're an illustrator, this might be useful. If you're a more uh, photo illustration kind of person, a graphic artist, this could be useful. But I am assuming that most people are photographers. So that's how I'm catering my lecture. Next, I'm assuming you want to actually edit your raw images. We're going to talk about how to take things a little bit far beyond maybe what's accurate, maybe what's normal. I'm expecting that you guys might be interested in that. So that's how I'm going to be catering things today. And I'm also going to uh, assume that you've spent a little bit of time just editing your photos, whether it's on your phone, whether it's on your computer, however you've manipulated your images. This will help you uh, do it even further, but I'm assuming you know a little bit about that. You've seen it. You've moved a contrast slider once in your life. Um, and then next, I'm assuming you're working on a calibrated monitor. If you don't know what that means, then go check out this video that I've made. It's <laughs> rmsv.tv slash calibration. I actually talk about this because if you don't have your monitor calibrated to accurate color standards, you might be moving your sliders and editing your pictures based on something that's not actually accurate. And then your photos aren't going to look accurate. So it's really important that you are looking at a calibrated screen and making your changes there. So I, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't mention it before we hop into editing. So if you need more information, there's a really a ton of it in this video. OK, so we're going to talk first about why we're here today, why we end up in this room, why we end up on this particular video, those of you who are watching online. And you may be asking yourself, like, why do we need to care about why? <laughs> um, but we do, because that will help us cater our approach to why we're changing the way that we edit our images. So the first one, maybe you just don't like the way your images look. Maybe you've been shooting for a while. Maybe uh, you take them. You love them when you see them on the back of the camera. But then when you see them in your computer, you just don't think they're as strong. Uh, and you want to know how to make them strong. So we can talk about that. Maybe you are comparing your images to other people, and you perceive their images as being more polished than your own. Maybe that's a reason. Um, and you hold your images next to them, and you wonder why your, yours don't look as polished. We'll talk about that. Or maybe you want to create a consistent look for your Instagram feed. And every single one of your images might look a little bit different from each other and not really feel as cohesive. So we'll talk about that. Or maybe it's a different reason. But the first thing we want to do is start with a clear vision. That's the goal. So what is the, what is the why? Where are we going? And how do we decide where that might be? Because it's going to be different for each individual person. So who are you as a photographer? And that actually really matters. That matters when you're trying to approach what is your style going to look like? Because everyone shoots a different way. Everyone is going to edit a different way as well. So I have some questions that it will be helpful for you guys and that will kind of guide your personal workflow. It'll make you uh, really consider where you're going with your photographs as well as your edits. And I think this is really vital. And not a lot of photographers actually take the time to do it. So I really encourage you to. So a few questions to reveal your style, questions you can ask yourself. And the first one is pretty strong. What do I want people to feel when they look at my images? And this might be different image to image, but there might be an overall, overall overarching reason why you take images, why you make photos. There might be a reason why you love photography. Um, and those are some things I want you guys to consider, because that can totally direct where you're going with your editing style and how you you make people feel when they look at your images. So those are two questions I highly recommend considering. The next one, what colors am I drawn to in everyday life? So this can actually be a great way to figure out what, what direction your style might go into, is what colors do you really love? Maybe you're a blue person, or maybe you're a yellow person. And maybe there's certain colors that just make you feel an awesome, like you need to take a picture right now, like that impulse to take photos. That might be your color. Uh, and maybe you want to bring that out. Maybe you want to de-emphasize all the other colors. Maybe there's a way that you can incorporate that into your style. So I really encourage you to think about that too. 
Next thing, who are my favorite photographers? So this can be a great way to start to realize like the type of photos that you really are drawn to is looking at whose images you're studying and you're enjoying and you're consuming the most. Who are those people? What do their images look like? And maybe even ask these questions about their images. What do I feel when I look at their images? Why do I like them? Um, that can help you hone in even closer. Um, and that goes back to what do I like most about those photographs? But there's a little phrase on the end here that's really important and I want to explain it. So what do I like most about other photographs that I wish I had taken? And what I mean by that is we're all here because we love photography, right? We're in this building, we love B&H, we love photos, we love gear, but there's some photos that we only like because they're beautiful. We don't actually wish that we had taken them. And I really want to make that distinction because, for instance, I love a variety of, of different photo genres. I love astrophotography that my husband does. I love, um, you know, every type of photography, really. I can't even think of one that I don't love. Um, but I particularly only photograph people. I like to photograph people, and I like to photograph my cats. Um, those are like <laughs> my two uh, genres of photography. And so I am not going to really uh, look at how people edit or look at their intention on the photographs that aren't my style, because that won't help me that much, right? So I want to think about what are the photographers making that are making images that I wish I had actually pushed the shutter on. I wish I had taken that photo. That's what will get you closer into knowing what is your style, because that's a big distinction. Okay, next thing, what are the five to ten photos that I've taken, that I've actually pushed the shutter on, and which one of those are closest to my dream style of my images? So looking at your own giant library of photos, narrow it down to just a handful that are actually making you feel like you're hitting the mark, that you're like really doing great with your photography, you love how they're feeling, you love how they're looking, they really make you spark. And, and that's another great way to know what is my style. And when you've answered all these questions, when you've looked at all these pictures, you should have hopefully some notes that you've taken and you've thought about these things. And that'll narrow it down to like, I like these colors, I like this mood, I like this feel, and that will move you closer to your style. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this going on, but this is super important. And the best part, no two photographers are ever going to answer this the exact same way, right? None of them. There's like six questions here. What are the likelihood that every single person in this room is going to answer it the same way? Like, I don't even know. None. Um, but the important thing of this is this becomes the backbone to creating something that's unique to you because no one's going to answer these the same way. And that's important. So our goal of today is for you to come closer to creating the style of image editing that you like most. So you know what you like, how do you create it? So that's our goal today. That's what we're working toward. I want to start by showing you a couple of quick examples. Um, some examples of unique editing styles. Whoop, one moment here. OK, so I have some Instagrams pulled up here. And these are some Instagrams of some of our students, some of our friends, some people that I admire. And I want to show you their pictures because they have some pretty unique styles, some pretty consistent uh, ways to edit their images. Um, and you can see here, Helby, um, he's a friend of ours. He's actually a grad. He really has like this deep love for sunset light, um, and as well as really bold blue tones. But all of his colors overall are pretty mood muted. They're pretty calm, they're pretty chill, and that's the, that's the mood that he wants people to feel when you look at his images. So Helby has some pretty cool work here, but that's a particular style, right? And you start to see when you look at them all together that they kind of have a consistency, even though they're photos in different places, even though they're photos with different colors, and that's really important to notice. Another one I'll show you here, um, my friend Grace. She has a pretty consistent feel of like low saturation, moody, tend to be a little bit more dark, and yet cheerful photographs. She shoots mostly weddings. And what's really cool about this is it's her style, right? You know that you're going to get this when you work with her. And that's what she wants to bring forth. She wants that calm, like nostalgic kind of feel to her images. Another one is Ryan Longnecker. He has some really cool um, photos that are, he really likes to hypersaturate the blues and the oranges. And that's his style. He loves that complementary color balance. And maybe that's something you might really like. Um, really bold colors, really bright, interesting photos. 
another photographer who's a friend and a graduate of ours. Um, this is her photography, and she really likes the super warm tones, maybe a little bit more green, um, but she likes high contrast. She's really interested in more high contrast photos, and so that's what she brings out. Next one I want to show you is um, my friend Tori, who also was our wedding photographer, and she has some really nice rosy tones. Like most of her highlights have kind of this pinkish hue, and it works great for her kind of wedding style of shooting, but that's what makes it feel more consistent, right? You start to have those colors picked out, you know what makes your heart sing with photography, and you know what you want to show people. You know that you want them to feel a certain way. You know what colors are really going to be important to you. And that starts to create that consistency. A couple more I want to show you. Cameron, um, she's also a grad, and she uh, actually likes really muted, more filmy, more matte vibes. And this really works well for her. A couple more. Mark really loves uh, like a deep, grungy black and white. That is his thing, and it works great. It's so fun, a little bit more of like a street photography element, um, and that's really cool too. Another for Florida photographer, um, Faith, she's a grad as well, and she has a very like up, um, upbeat, cheerful, colorful, light and airy kind of style. Maybe you're a very bright person. Maybe you want white everywhere. Maybe you want ethereal, maybe you want uh, very um, bold, bright colors. And this uh, is another graduate of ours. Um, they actually shoot weddings together. And this is really bright photos, but it works great for what they're trying to get across. The next thing and last one I want to show you is Michaela. She's another graduate, and she worked for us for a long time. Um, she loves blues and oranges. That's like her thing. She loves blue and orange. She loves that complement, but more of like a deeper blue. And um, so that comes out in all of her images. But one other thing I want to notice here is she loves backlighting too. That's part of her style. So beyond just editing, the way that she's seen is coming through, and that's true about all of these images. Um, she's constantly trying to search for a certain type of light and a certain way of shooting and that's what starts to make things feel consistent that's what starts to make you have a style is when you notice the things that you love and you chase after them and that's what I want you guys to consider today so going back to what we're talking about here our goal of today is getting you guys to come closer to creating that style and through those examples through those examples you guys have seen um, a few other uh, styles that are out there. That is literally just a handful of the millions of amazing photographers in the world. And I totally encourage you to look at all of them to get inspired about what your particular style might be. So with that in mind, I alluded, this, alluded to this in the last um, example I showed you, but knowing how the sliders work in Lightroom is only the starting place. It's your intentionality that will actually make your images stand out. Because if you're not taking the time to really think about what you're putting into your photograph, it's not going to start to feel consistent or cohesive or unique compared to your other images. It'll just be picture here, picture there, picture there. And my goal is to help you guys really look at it and consider why you're taking those photos and how you're going to make them stand out. So this is what we're looking for today. Uh, what are the things that make up your editing style? So a few things that we really need to consider beyond just editing are things like composition. How are we actually framing our images? For instance, you might be the type of person who really loves to shoot and you love negative space in a lot of your images. That can become part of your style. That's like part of what you're actually going to uh, sh look for in a situation. You start to see that you're looking for that and it becomes like a light bulb moment where you're intentionally starting to look for it even more. Maybe it's something like you really like to center your subjects. That could be a compositional style. Beyond that, we've got lighting direction or source. So two different ways that lighting can play a huge difference in how our style develops. So which direction is the light coming from? For instance, I showed you Michaela likes to backlight things a lot. And the source of the light also changes things. Maybe you're always shooting on a, at golden hour, so all of your photos have a really nice golden hue. Maybe you're shooting under uh, studio lights for most of your images, so you have that super polished, super accurate, daylight balanced light. Maybe it's something else, and that's going to be a huge uh, identifier of what your images look like. 
Next, what do you want people to feel? Just like I mentioned, so what is the mood or the emotion or the feeling that you want people to take away when they look at your images? Beyond that, what is the mood or emotion or feeling that you got when you stood in that place and you clicked that shutter? That can give you an inkling of what you like to photograph and why. Next, what are those tones or specific colors? So we're going to talk a little bit more about this when we actually get into our panels, but what tones and colors speak to you? What tones and colors are standing out? Because um, it might not be every one, and you might not want each one to be equally emphasized. Next is brightness or darkness. And this is, again, something that's really important, because not every uh, photographer is going to want things to be just as bright as another photographer. Another person might want more moody. Another person want, might want more contrast. And while there's an important uh, emphasis on accuracy, I really encourage you guys to try to make things look fairly accurate as far, far as having some contrast, because that's something that we want to make interesting for people. Uh, the brightness or darkness overall is a consistency thing in your images. And then last thing, quality. And what I mean by this is trying to shoot as much as possible. The more you shoot, the more you know this. And the more you shoot, the more you get strong as a photographer. And the more your images will show that you're creating quality work. So this is something I want you guys to consider. OK, so it does begin in the camera, right? Every time that you pick up your camera and you're about to take a picture, that is when this process starts. It doesn't start when you're sitting down at your computer. It starts when you pick up your camera. So I want you guys to really think about that when you're getting out there, you're in the field, what are you shooting and why? And how are you going to formulate that in a way that brings your vision to life? Um, sometimes we do have those snapshots, and that's awesome. Um, everybody needs snapshots on their phone. Um, but when you're taking a picture that you really want to be strong, think about it. Here is a very um, simple example of a color chart as far as what emotions or what words or what thoughts come up when we see certain colors. And this is one of many, a million charts on the internet that indicate these things. Um, but it can help you decide which colors will actually support the mood of your image and which will detract from the mood of your image. It's a starting point for knowing what to emphasize as well as what to remove. So I really love looking at color theory, how our brains interpret these colors, because that makes a big difference in how people will interpret the photos that we actually are showing them. So thinking about these things can be really useful. All right, next thing, what are some basic image editing tools that you guys like to use most? So tell me, what are some of those sliders? What are some of those controls that we have in Lightroom that you like to use regularly? Anybody have anything? Which sliders? Which panels? Yeah. Um, I use uh, Clarity. Clarity, yeah. And uh, the highlights and shadows. Highlights and shadows, yep. So you really like to emphasize some of that contrast, contrast. maybe. Mm hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Any others? I like split toning. Mm hmm. It's kind of like a hiding one. Split toning. I discovered it kind of recently. Yeah. You can make your photo really warm or cool. Yeah, it, it's a very like effect adding thing. It's not like a basic, but it helps it take a little bit further. We'll talk a little bit about split toning today. Anybody else have one you want to say? Yeah. I use the black a lot, and I like to change things like some more of Okay, so bringing blacks down, so making it up. Okay, cool. So bringing blacks up and changing the temperature to a cool tone. Awesome. Anybody else have anything they really like to do? Yeah. Sharpness. Sharpness. We like sharpness, right? It helps make things pop. It makes them crisp crispy. OK, great. Um, what's your favorite slider or panel if you only had to use one for the rest of your life? Isn't that a tough one? Contrast. Contrast? OK. Clarity. Clarity? Anybody else? Lighting. Lighting. So out in the field or in Lightroom? Like, huh? like the exposure? Yeah. Cool. Anybody else? I like the radio. The oh, the radial gradient? That one's fun. If you guys haven't played with the radial gradient in Lightroom, it's awesome. Cool. So I ask you these things so that we can think about what are the things that we do over and over in Lightroom. That can also give you a really good idea of where your style is, where it naturally falls. Because you're going to emphasize some colors, and you're going to de-emphasize some colors, and you're going to be more contrasty or less contrasty. And that can help you notice what you like. So I like to make people think about these things. Um, so. We tend to start kind of wiggling around in these panels a little bit more than we might spend time in other panels. 
Today, I want to talk a, a little bit about some specific panels in Lightroom that I personally find the most useful for creating a unique style. So beyond like um, some of the basic stuff, we're going to talk a little bit about the basic panel, but not much. We're going to talk about these particular panels today. My favorite panel, if I had to pick one for the history of forever, I would pick HSL. If I could have the HSL panel, I would be able to edit any photo and make it awesome. But if I didn't have the HSL panel, I think I would be very sad as a photographer. And unfortunately, I didn't find it until like two years ago. I don't know why. I've been shooting for like 10 years, and I didn't even happen upon this beautiful panel until just a couple years ago. So I encourage you guys to play, experiment, see what you come up with, because that was my story. Maybe there's something else that you really like. Um, but these are the panels we're going to talk about today. We're going to start with basic. We're going to talk about HSL. We're going to talk about curves, split toning a little bit, and camera calibration a little bit. And the reason for this is they alter color the most. They make a big difference on what colors show up in our images. Um, so that's what we're going to discuss. Uh, so the first panel that I want to actually discuss before we go into Lightroom is HSL. And the reason for that is that HSL requires a little bit of background explanation beyond just uh, looking at the panel and changing sliders. So I want to understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. So HSL panel, the first one we have is HUE, right? So HSL is actually an acronym. It stands for Hue, Saturation, and Luminance. And the HUE is essentially the color of the color. So what is the shade? Where does it fall on the color wheel? Is it like a greenish blue or a yellowish blue? Is it a reddish orange or a yellowish orange? That will actually um, be completely different in each photo, what might be the best choice. But that's important to understand. What what we're changing when we change the hue. Next one is saturation. And what we're changing when we change the saturation of a particular color is we're changing that color's intensity. So if we're taking the saturation up or down of just blue, that's going to make it either a more intense blue, so more bold. Picture um, mixing water in a can of paint. So mixing extra water in a can of paint. The more you put water in, the more you're desaturating. At the get-go, it's the most intense. So that's how we can kind of picture saturation. It's going to be either the most intense or or a little bit less intense as we mix it with water. It's kind of a good way to think about it. And then the last one here is luminance. And that's essentially the color's whiteness or blackness. Often it can be described as brightness or darkness, but that's not entirely accurate. Picture it more as like you have your can of paint, and maybe it's a blue can of paint. You mix in white or you mix in black. And it's moving that color closer to white or closer to black. That's actually going to be what uh, luminance is doing for you. So it's going to make it a darker version of blue or a lighter version of blue. And that's super important before we dive in. I want to show you this real fast because um, having a color wheel can really help you picture that hue part of the HSL equation. And this is essentially the color spectrum. So let's say we had like an orange tone. And in Lightroom, we wanted to shift that hue slider left and right, and we wanted to see which uh, tone might be better. The limitation of Lightroom as opposed to Photoshop, we can do a lot more in Photoshop, but in Lightroom it's only going to allow you to move that orange tone closer to red or closer to yellow. Only the adjacent colors on the uh, color wheel. It's not going to let you make an orange tone blue. It's not going to let you make an orange tone uh, magenta. It's only going to let you shift it toward the most adjacent colors. And that's important to understand because it might not do what you're trying to get it to. Um, but it's not designed to do that. It's designed to keep things looking the most authentic as to what was created in the scene. So that's HSL. Before we hop into another panel, any questions before we move on? OK, it's a pretty straightforward one. I love HSL. The next one I want to talk about is definitely not straightforward, and it's called curves. Um, how many of you have used curves before? OK, raise your hand again if you know how to use curves really, really, really well, and you really understand what's going on in the background. <laughs> OK, yeah, I would not have raised my hand until I went to school at RMSP because it is not intuitive, right? It's pretty awesome, um, but it's got a lot of math going on in the background. And I want you guys to understand a little bit about what's going on so that you can know what you're doing when you're doing it, which will obviously help us to make more informed decisions in our editing. So you'll see on the bottom of the curve, you'll see this uh, line called, uh, it's actually a gradient, black to white. 
And you'll only see that gradient in Photoshop's version of curves, so that's what I screenshotted for you because it's a little bit easier to understand. But just imagine it in Lightroom's version because that's what Lightroom's assuming. So you've got this gradient down at the bottom for black to white. You've got black on the left and white on the right. And that is essentially uh, representing the tones in your image. So if you have a histogram, you guys know on a histogram, it's graphing the tones of your image. So uh, you can see it roughly in the background here. The image that I was working with had a lot of blacks. So notice how the blacks are actually going all the way up to the top. And I have a lot of dark uh, tones in my image, and then I have much fewer lighter tones. So that's what we're representing here when we look at our curve. We're seeing essentially the amount of tones in our image, and we have the opportunity to change them. So that line on the bottom is essentially called the before, or the input side of the curve, and that is essentially where your image starts. Picture that as the axis on this graph, because it is a graph. And on the left side, we've got the after or the output axis. And essentially, that is going to tell you where that tone has become after you've moved your curve. So you start with a certain uh, tonality, and then you can look at where it has moved to by matching it up against that left axis. So this is essentially just going to graph that tone for us. Let me give you an example so it starts to make some sense. Moving that line will actually change that, uh, that tone to something different. So moving that line up, so I just clicked in the center of that uh, little line that we had in the middle here. I clicked in the center, added a point, and dragged it straight up. And what I did there was I've actually taken all of the image and I've made it brighter. And I want to show you why. Um, the majority of the image have, has gotten brighter. Look at the bottom there, down in the middle. If we were to draw a line from the point that I made down to the bottom of the graph, that's essentially a mid-tone, right? That's essentially a very middle gray because it's right in between black and white on the spectrum. If I run the line up and then I go over to the left-hand side and I see what that tone has become, it's become a pretty light gray. It's lighter than middle gray now. And you can see if we were to pinpoint points on this entire line, we can see many tones have changed, right? I've actually taken it pretty far. And what this would look like in the photograph is that my image has gotten much brighter, but my white and my black point have not gotten brighter, right? Because my white and my black point, those very ends, have not changed. And that's what curves can supply to us, is more fine-tunable changes to our contrast, to our tones, to our images. One more example before we move on. So let's say in this example, I put one point a little bit higher up on my curve, so in closer to the lighter tones, and I moved it up. I put one point a little bit darker on my curve, closer to the darker tones, and I moved it down. What that's doing is it's making a simple S curve. You guys have probably heard that term. Many of you have done it. This is going to add a little more contrast to your image because adding more lights to your lighter tones and more darks to your darker tones is essentially the definition of contrast. We're darkening the darks, lightening the lights, and that's going to make our images a little bit more crispy. Um, so that's curves. That's where we're going to start. Do you guys have questions before we walk in? Okay. To Lightroom we go. So I'm going to talk today about how we use these tools. We're going to talk about these particular panels in the realm of how do we use them to correct color and to make emphasized colors. Um, and also, we're going to talk a little bit about how to edit two totally different photos and start to make them look the same. We're going to talk about how to edit a whole sequence with a preset. So as we move in, we'll get my projector to behave. Let's open up Lightroom. And let's work on a few particular images. So the first one that I want to work on with you guys, we're just going to look at in the develop, um, in the basic panel. So we're in the develop module of Lightroom. We've got a photo pulled up. It's just a mediocre photo of flowers. <laughs> it's not even entirely sharp, but I want to show this to you guys because it's a good example of showing what the basic panel can do. It's just a simple photo, simple tones. We got some colors, we got some contrast, we got some different light. So if I was to hop over here to the basic panel, which is this first panel when you open up Lightroom, 
I can do some pretty simple changes. The first one that you guys should look at when you're in the basic panel is exposure because this is where you can correct any mistakes you might have made in the field and it's also where you can uh, intentionally add or detract some light from the image. So this one, I actually think my exposure was pretty close here. I don't think I'm going to change it, but I always check it first before I move on. The next thing I'm going to check is actually my blacks and my whites. So I wish that Lightroom would e reorder these things for me, but alas, it's probably not going to do it for me. Um, I check blacks and whites next because I want to set my black point and my white point on my histogram. That's going to say how dark is the darkest thing and how light is the lightest thing. So I'm going to set my black and white point here. And I'm going to move that black down until I actually clip a little bit on my histogram. You can see the histogram up here in the right hand corner. It's putting tones all the way down into that dark area. And then I'm also going to bring my whites up just a smidge so that I have a nice bright white in the photo. But then if I think that I still need some work to these lighter and darker tones, that's where my highlights and shadows will come in. So highlights and shadows, you can think of them as they're not the whitest thing and they're not the blackest thing, but they're the lights and the darks, just a little bit darker than the brightest white and just a little bit lighter than the darkest black. So those are the next two sliders I'm gonna work on to try to pull out as much information in this photograph. Because right off the bat, it's a raw photo. It doesn't have that much going on. I need to pull these sliders to get it looking as what I saw in the field. So that's the goal of the basic panel, is to get things back to looking what you saw in the field. Shadows and highlights, I'm going to bring up a little bit my shadows and I'm going to bring down quite a lot my highlights so that I see some nice detail in those flowers because they were pretty bright with the bright sky that I shot under that day. But I'm going to leave my whites up and you can see how that made my histogram a nice spread. I've got a nice bright white, I've got a nice dark black, but I've got a nice variety of tones in the middle. So I'm going to get a stronger image because I can see more of the tonalities emerging from my photograph. Next, there are some more sliders down here at the bottom. I'm not going to talk too much about any of them except for Clarity. Um, clarity is a really great slider. I generally recommend not to pull it lower because it starts to make things look pretty unrealistic pretty quickly. Um, for instance, if I was to pull it lower now, it starts to look kind of like video gamey, um, and that's not really want this one, what I want this one to look like. But if I pull Clarity up, it can emphasize the edges in my photo. That's essentially what Clarity is doing. It's different from sharpness. It's actually looking at each individual edge in my image, and it's going to push the darker part of the edge to darker and the lighter part of the edge to lighter to emphasize it, to add minute contrast. And that's important because I really want these edges to pop. I want them to be strong. But generally, I won't go above like 30 on my clarity because it'll start to look pretty crunchy pretty quickly. So I'm going to just add maybe like 10 points. I tend to add about 10 points of clarity to almost every image that I make. It's a really awesome slider, and I really like what it can do. So that is essentially working through the basic panel real fast. The one slider that I missed is white balance, and I want to talk about that quickly because white balance is awesome. And white balance here, we have our temperature slider, and we also have our tint slider. And the temperature slider is going to move us closer to blue or closer to yellow, and the tint slider is going to go from magenta to green. And these are just two different channels of light. So I'm going to actually play with this to get it to look a little bit closer to what I saw in the field. And I actually move things a little bit closer to uh, warmer yellow because that's more realistic to what I saw out there in the field. I was shooting under a more cloudy day, which nat naturally adds a little bit of blue to my photo. So I'm going to correct that. So looking OK, let's try it on this photo. So this is actually a really terrible astrophoto that I took because I'm not an astrophotographer, but I like it because the sky was so incredible looking. Look at that like whooshy thing over there on the left. Um, so I'm going to actually crop this real fast. So I'm going to grab my crop tool because I can't handle that little extra tree on the side. But once I get that out of there, uh, I'm going to go through and do the exact same thing. Now this one's a little darker, so I can pull my exposure up quite a bit, but I don't want to pull it up so far that it looks unrealistic, because I want this to still stay nighttime. Um, so I'm going to pull it up quite a bit, and I'm going to actually pull up my shadows first, because my blacks are pretty black and my whites are pretty white. And that's going to bring out this nice green foreground. So that's going to get me pretty close to a pretty nice looking image. I can play with these sliders, and I totally encourage you to always test and see if one of them will give you a closer look of what you're trying to achieve. I think White's Up works pretty well. 
my blacks are just going to be black no matter what I do to them. And then I can add a little bit of clarity. So this is essentially like a quick run through through the basic panel. Anybody have any quick questions before I move on? Okay, so let's add to the mix. So we have our basic panel, which is going to allow us to do those basic changes of contrast and exposure and white balance, all of those things that we really value as photographers. Now let's add a couple of more things. So this is a photo that is a little twisted, so I'm going to fix that in crop. And I'm going to go through and I'm going to do a very, very quick basic panel on this thing because I want to get to a next panel. So that looks okay. What I want to do is I want to move down to HSL. So HSL is my favorite panel, as I mentioned. And HSL is hue, saturation, and luminance of each individual color in your images. And that's awesome, because you can see here, we have this little uh, ball of sliders. And all of those sliders are going to do something a little bit different. And then there's tabs, so you can dive even deeper. You've got hue, saturation, and luminance as three separate tabs. That's pretty awesome. I want to look at the picture here and think, what are the colors I like about this and what are the colors I don't like about this? And in my opinion, the blue is actually a little bit garish. It's realistic. I didn't change it, but it's a little bit brighter than I particularly want because I'm not much of a blue, bright blue person. Um, so I'm actually going to go into my saturation and I'm going to pull that blue saturation down. Maybe not too far, because I don't want to lose the color completely. But down a little bit, it helps those yellow um, stalks of wheat to come forward, right? Because blue and orange are actually complementary. So the warm color is going to pull toward us, and the blue color is going to recede. And if I desaturate it even more, it's not going to bother me as much. But beyond that, I want to go to hue. Because personally, I really like kind of an aqua hue to my blues, a little bit more of like a greenish, tealish color. But I don't want it to look too far from realistic. So if I just pull that over a little bit, just a tiny bit, I really like what that's doing. Now that's me, that's my particular style. You might think, well, I love the blue and I hate the yellow, and that's okay too. I want you guys to think about what are the colors you really like, what are the colors that are stronger in your minds, and how can you bring them out? I'm just showing you the tools here today. So. Another example for you, I showed you this image, and we actually, I already did a little bit of, oh, no I didn't. This is plain, great, so let's work with it. Um, so I'm going to add a little bit of contrast here, and let's hop down to that uh, basic panel, because we can do some nice things here. Or sorry, we're in the basic panel. Let's hop to the HSL panel. So everything's looking pretty good, but I really want to show you HSL on this picture because it does a lot. And the reason being is that I have a lot of colors to work with. I have a bright orange, I have a pretty bright blue, and I have a pretty bright green. But something that's really important is I want to change the green here, but Lightroom doesn't always see the colors that I see as the same colors that it sees. So that's important to understand too. And Lightroom is actually tends to see um, a lot of greens as more yellow, and it tends to see a lot of oranges as more red. And you'll start to see this as you work with it a little bit more, but HSL here is going to provide me the framework so that I can actually start changing the things that I want to change. So, what do you guys like about this? Let's let you pick. What do you guys like? What do you not like? Questions? Hair's too red, right? It's very red. She had just had her mom re-dye it the night before this picture. <laughs> How dare she? <laughs> yes? Yes, her skin tone. She has a lot of pink coming out in her face, right? Which looks a little bit unrealistic. Anything else you guys want to change? The what was that? Tone the background, right? Do you want to tone it up or tone it down? Down. down, so a little bit less bright. OK, cool. What was that? Less headroom. Yes, we can crop that right away. Let's do it. And that'll get rid of those bright little bokeh spots up there. Much stronger, right? Now we're closer to like a 4 by 5 crop, and her, name, her head has a nice frame around it. So let's start here with HSL. Let's change her skin tone a little bit, because that's the first thing that we see, right? That's the brightest thing. And so first, I want to go to um, the hue slider. And the reason being is because the pink on her cheeks is a little bit much, and we want to make sure that she looks accurate. That's always our goal with skin tones. It's super important that whatever image you have that you take of a person, their skin looks like their skin, because we want that. Uh, if you're taking an image of a person and they start to look maybe a little bit more like a pumpkin, or they look 
a little bit more um, not like their face. That's not good. So we want to make sure it's accurate. So I'm going to click here in my red and my oranges and twist them side to side and see which one's going to get me closer to what I want. I think red going a little bit more to the orange direction is going to fix that hue a little bit. And then I think that orange, if I pull that a little bit closer to the right direction, that'll kind of help with her hair a little bit. Then I'm going to move on to saturation because under the saturation tab, I think I can tone down that hair even a little bit more and I think I can play with her facial, facial features a little bit more too. So let's see what Lightroom thinks her hair is. Looks like it's mostly orange. So I'm going to click and drag that around. Obviously if I go down too far, I lose the color in her skin too. So that's really important to be gentle with these sliders. Um, and if I go too, too far, it looks very bad very fast. So let's just tone it down a smidge. I think that helps a little bit. Um, her hair looks much more natural, much more uh, realistic. And then if I go up to the red slider here, I can either saturate or desaturate those reds to make it look more realistic. I actually think our hue slider took care of a lot of the facial pinkness, but I can play with this here and I actually think bringing it down a smidge helps. And then magenta. I always like to look at magenta with skin tones because sometimes that will change some things. It doesn't do too much here, but you can always look for it. Okay, the last thing is luminance. We haven't really looked at luminance yet, and that can make a big difference with her skin. So this is one that people tend to stay away from. This is like the last thing you touch in the HSL panel because we're not really sure what it's gonna do, and we're not really sure if we're gonna like what it's gonna do. So I always encourage you guys to experiment because it's not always gonna be as scary as you think, uh, and you can always change it back because that's the beauty of Lightroom. Uh, but in luminance, I can change the reds and the orange, and I'm gonna move them closer to white or closer to black. And you can see that actually greatly affects her skin tone here, which is kind of interesting. If I wanna bring her freckles out a little bit more and maybe darken her lips, I can pull the red down. If I want to make her skin more luminous and her lips more luminous, I can bring it up. I think I like it down a little bit because I love her freckles. And then if I want to play with orange as well, if I bring that up, I think it's actually gonna help her stand out from the background a little bit more. So a little bit of luminance and playing with it can really help you guys fine tune those colors in your photos. And it's something that people don't normally think about because it's that slider that you never really look at. Um, so bringing up luminance here I think works pretty well. Okay, next let's play with yellow. And yellow, I think it's gonna do a little bit with our leaves, right? Because we don't like how bright those leaves are. So if I bring the luminance down on the yellow, it's going to make that background fall away even more. And looking up here, both of our TVs are showing things a little bit different. Um, so let me actually tone this down a little bit uh, because you guys are seeing not what I'm seeing on my screen. So let's actually take this back a little bit. Does that look better to you guys? Maybe a little bit better. Okay, so next thing, let's keep working on those leaves. So let's go back to hue. I think I actually might wanna change the hue here to a little bit more of a greenish green as opposed to a yellowish green because it feels a little bit more lively, a little more springy. It actually was spring, but those leaves were pretty dark. Um, and then I'm gonna play with the greens and just see what comes up. A little bit of a softer green. I think that kind of fades away a little bit more that yellowy green, a little bit of a bluer green, it's gonna stand out a little more. So because we wanna kind of fade them away, I might bring it back to the little bit of the yellow side, and then I'm gonna go back to saturation. So this is the thing I wanna want you guys to take away from this example, is that you're going to be bouncing back and forth. Don't just say, I'm gonna move this slider and it's gonna be perfect, because I wish I had a slider like that, but it's never gonna work exactly as you want. So when you're working in HSL, I constantly find myself bouncing back and forth, like working with hue, working with saturation, working with luminance of any particular color, or just playing with one panel at a time. Constantly in photos, I'll actually see like, I've done like a little bit of every one and my little hue sliders look like this and my saturation sliders look like this. Just those minute changes can make a big difference in your photos. So don't be afraid to dive in and see what's gonna happen. I'm gonna move on to the next one here because I wanna show you an example of how cool this uh, tool can be. This is an image of delicious, yummy French toast. And this French toast is looking pretty good, except there's this blue light coming in from the window that I'm not super fond of because it's not really part of my image, right? I want it to be a nice, uh, simple, natural looking image. And while the light coming in is natural light, it's detracting from the warm tones in my image. 
So I'm going to actually go in to the saturation panel of my uh, hue saturation luminance panel, and I'm going to tone that blue down by actually desaturating it. And I'm going to see how much I can desaturate it, see desaturate it without it looking ridiculous. And I think I can have it. I think I can have it go down right about here. So notice what that's doing here. If we turn our little light switch on and off, and we want to see the difference between with blue and without blue, look at how much of a difference that's actually making in the photo. Like that completely changes the feel of the image because we lose some of that uh, kind of like more distracting, more complementary blue tone that's sneaking in. Like very rarely would we notice that kind of thing. But I went into HSL and I played and that's what made me notice that it was there. So I highly encourage you just to play with these sliders because you might not even see it with your naked eye until you move it. And then you're like, wow, I like that so much better. So just keep experimenting. The next thing I want to show you guys is in here, I want to show you how we can actually emphasize and Im make those skin tones even more uh, lovely. So this one here, my friend was standing in some beautiful cloudy shade light and I think that her skin looks pretty good except I think that I can make it even stronger. And the reason being is we have a little bit of like uh, reddish on her face that I don't think is necessarily supposed to be there. And I think that her skin is actually pulling in a little bit of reflection from uh, like brown on the ground and I don't want that. So I'm gonna play with my hue and my saturation and try to get this a little bit closer to what I think is realistic to what she looks like. That's a little bit closer. She looks a little bit more like that in real life. And then also, let's see what yellow will do for us. A little bit closer to that orange side will be a little bit stronger. Okay, and then luminance. Luminance is that hidden gem that most people don't encounter in Lightroom. And notice if I bring that up, it's gonna look so much stronger because it's actually gonna kind of fill in some of the dark spots on her face and it's gonna make it look a little bit more luminous. Uh, so I really like playing with that. Again, our TVs are a little bit different in here. I'm looking at this one to try to edit, um, but it's gonna be a little bit different on every screen until you calibrate. So that's why I was talking about calibrating your monitor. We wanna make sure we keep up with accurate colors. Um, so next thing I wanna show here is another um, solution fix. So this is a common fix that you guys might run into and that's why I put it in here. Let's say you're shooting in a room that has maybe more warm tone walls. This is a super common paint color and as photographers I wish it didn't exist but it does. So we have super warm walls in a lot of rooms. Thank you Event Space for making this beautiful gray. Um, but <laughs> the warm walls in these rooms can reflect on our people, right? They can reflect on everything. And it can cause this super yellowy, super orangey cast in our images that's a little bit more than what was actually there. And if we want to fix that, HSL is one of the perfect pla places to fix it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do like a quick white balance adjustment because our white balance is a little bit off because I want the instructor here to be the only one I care about. And if I move this closer to the blue side, she looks a little bit more accurate in her tone. But then, oh, still not looking accurate up there. Hang on. That's much better. But then I want to come down to HSL because HSL on that yellow and that orange spectrum is going to make a lot of difference here. So I'm going to start with saturation because that's where I think I'm going to see the biggest change. And I'm going to pull that orange actually up a little bit because the floor is the orange and I want to emphasize that beautiful color of that hardwood floor. But then I'm going to pull that yellow down because look how much yellow is actually coming in from out there and from these lights that are on the wall. This is a nice kind of buttery yellow room and it was looking really much more than buttery yellow. Um, so I'm gonna pull that yellow down a little bit more and look at how much better that is looking. So I'm gonna turn my little light switch on and off. Look at these changes here. So we have this like bright yellow wall that is much more yellow than it actually is in real life. And if we bring that down, it's much more realistic looking, right? So HSL can solve some of those yellow wall problems that we see in real life. Okay, any questions before we move on? Okay. <coughs> All right, this is a terrible self-portrait of me. Um, but I wanted to show you this because it's a great example 
of curves. So that's the next tool I want to talk about with you guys. And again, this is a very powerful tool. It has so many um, layers to it. But this tool can make a big difference in the contrast of your image, first and foremost. So let's say we've already worked in the basic panel. We've already gotten things looking pretty good. Um, in fact, I think I did. Hey, look, I did. Um, but I want to make things even stronger. So in the tone curve, the first thing I want to look at is I have my um, starting point down here at the bottom. I want to actually add a little bit of brightness to my brighter tone. So remember, if I just click on the right side of the curve and move it up, that's going to increase the brightness of my brighter tones. If I want to move my darker tones a little bit closer to dark tones, I'm going to move that down. So over on the left hand side, I can move it down. We've created a simple little S curve here. Okay, next thing I want to do is I want to actually create a specific effect with this curve. You guys may have seen some, usually it's actually pretty prominent in fashion, um, to have a little bit more of a muted bright tone and a little bit more of an emphasized dark tone. So it makes things look pretty crisp while still looking like modern and forefront. So that's something I want to show to you guys. It's pretty easy to do, um, but it takes a little bit of a, a mouse flick um, in Lightroom. It's a little bit frustrating, their little curve tool here. But if I click that uppermost point, I can drag it around. So my white doesn't have to stay perfectly white. I can actually move it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually move that point down just a little bit and if I turn my light switch on and off, you can see it's actually clipping some of those high white highlights. It's going to take what was pure white and actually make it a very, very, very light gray. And it's going to do it on a pretty broad spectrum because it's adjusting that entire upper area of the curve. But what this does is it actually kind of creates that softer light look. And you don't want to go too far here because it can look really bad really fast like this and then that doesn't look realistic at all. But if you do it just a little bit, it can look OK. And then I'm actually going to bring my blacks, my blackest point, and I'm going to pull it in a little bit. I want to make my dark grays also black. So by pulling this in, it's actually making a very uh, intense contrast while still not making those whites too white. And then I can move around my middle part of my curve until I get it looking to where I think it looks best. And what's cool about this is it's just a, another unique trick that you can add to your tool belt. Um, so if you look at this on and off, look at the difference here. So that's pretty normal. And then if we add this, it adds that emphasis, it adds that change, and it also adds contrast. But it's not too much. So I really like this tool. And I think it can do so much for us. That's just one layer of many. Let's go to this next one. So this is another image that I think could benefit from a little bit more kind of a nostalgic feel. So I want to add a little bit more of a filmy look to it, a little bit more matte. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to keep my, keep my curve a little bit lighter up at the top here. And I'm going to keep my curve a little bit darker down at the bottom, add a basic S curve. Most of the time in the curve, you're going to be working with an S curve to add more contrast. But then I'm actually going to pull the baseline of my curve up a little bit. And what that does is it makes my darkest blacks clipped so that there is no dark black anymore. Now that darkest black is actually a little bit of a dark gray. But it goes in the other direction. So this is interesting because if I keep this dark black here, it can still have quite a bit of contrast. But that dar darkest black is actually much darker than uh, are actually much grayer than we necessarily see it to be. And you can look at the difference here. So that adds like a little bit of a matte look to this photo. And it's kind of interesting what it can do. So I really like this technique because sometimes a photo really benefits from this particular look. So I encourage you guys to think about it, to try it. Um, yes? Do you, do you do this after you've done the basic? Or like right yes. Yep, I always do basic panel first. That's a great question. And the reason for it is that basic panel can often take care of a lot of things that I would do in other panels. And that's because basic is so powerful. Basic with the, hue, uh, with the highlights and shadows and the blacks and whites can make a huge difference. But a, an effect like this, when you actually want to move your black and move your white point, that can't, make, that can't happen in basic panel. So I knew I had to come here. But yes, I normally do basic for everything. Every photo deserves the basic panel at least. Okay. That so light switch just takes you back one step. 
Uh, actually, this little light switch, it's going to turn off that entire panel. That's a great question. So the light switch, if I turn it on, it's going to take these effects that I've made in that panel, and it's actually going to make them active. If I turn it off, it's going to deactivate the entire panel so that I can't see any changes that I made on my photo in that panel. Good question. Any other questions before we move on? All right, so next one I want to show you. This one I have done quite a bit of work on, and I want to show you it because there's another layer of curves that you guys could consider. I'm not going to spend too much time on it today because it's really a push and play kind of thing. You really need to do it yourself to really see what it's doing. Um, but there are channels to our curve. So we were working on the RGB channel, which means red, green, and blue. That's all of our channels of light that we can see added up. And that means that we're essentially just working on tones. We're just working on black and white in the background of our photo. We're just making things more contrasty or less contrasty. We're working with how bright or how dark. But when you click on this uh, little drop down here, you'll actually see there is a red, green, and a blue separate channel. And what's interesting about this is you can now edit the overall red channel of your image or the overall green or the overall blue channel and change things within that. And that's really cool because it can make things even more stylistically interesting. If I click on the red here, look at some things that I did here. I added quite a bit of points to make this a nice strong escrow with a couple of particular um, bends and twists in it. I also manipulated the green to have a little bit of an S-curve as well. But notice here I didn't take the greens down as far in the depth of the photo, in the, in the darker tones. And the reason for that is because when you're working with these channels, when you increase or decrease that, uh, the amount on that line, when you're changing it, you're actually changing it to another tonality, another color. So what's the opposite of red on the color wheel? What was that? Bluish? Cyan? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear it. Um, yeah, so it's cyan. So opposite of red is cyan, which is bluish and greenish. It's both. And then the opposite of green. Anybody? Opposite of green? Magenta. Pinkish, yep. Opposite of green is magenta. And then the opposite of blue? Yellow, yes. So opposite of blue is yellow. Opposite of green is magenta. Opposite of red is cyan. So anytime that we're making adjustments here, look at the difference here. If I click and drag in the green highlights, in the green brighter areas, and I drag that down, it's going to add magenta to my brightest areas. Interesting, right? So this gives you even more power within your curve, which is really incredible. But you can also screw things up really quickly. So the, the uh, warning that I would give you with curves is that you can uh, move gingerly because curves can go really crazy really quickly. And all you have to do is double click on that little thing and it goes away. You can double click on any point that you've made and you can actually remove it completely. Or you can click and drag it off. But that is something that can happen pretty easily. So then if I go into my blue channel here, you can see I've added blue in the highlights and I've decreased the blue in the shadows so that it's a little bit more of a warm shadow and a little bit more of a cool highlight. And then by layering all of those things, by layering the red, green, and the blue channels, what happens is that I've increased and decreased the contrast and the color in each of those channels, which means that I've actually um, added a lot more contrast to my image that I couldn't do with just the RGB channel. But I've added it selectively. So I've actually added a little bit less of uh, yellow to my shadows, or more, more yellow to my shadows. I've added more cyan to my shadows, more red to my highlights, more green to my highlights, and more uh, magenta to my shadows. And what's interesting about this is you can be so selective. And I want to turn this on and off, and you guys can see how big of a change it makes. So I've went through all of those panels. Look at how it not only changes the contrast, that brightness and darkness, but it also changes the color quite a lot. That's a huge change, right? That makes a big difference in your, in your photo overall. So I highly encourage you guys to play with this because curved channels can be incredible. How many of you have played with them before? 
OK, good, a few of you, awesome. Um, and again, this can be something that becomes part of that style. So let's say you really like cooler shadows in your image. This is a really awesome way to add cooler shadows. You would simply grab that uh, green or blue channel, and you would increase the green or blue in the shadows. Or you could grab the red channel and pull it down to add more cyan in the shadows. Does that make sense? So think of it as a flip-flop. So the opposite of red, if you pull red up, it's going to add more red to that section of the curve. If you pull red down, it's going to add more cyan to that section of the curve. And then same with our other ones. It's, go it's always going to uh, add more of that particular color on, as the name of that channel when you pull up. And it's going to add its opposite when you pull down. That's a great way to think about it. Any more questions on that? I know it's like, whoa, mind blown. But it's pretty cool what it can do for you. OK, cool. So curves is powerful. We saw that difference here, not only in contrast, but also in color. We can dive in a little bit deeper. I want to show you on this photo how we can actually play with that for a minute. So on this particular photo, if I was to uh, look at it objectively and think, what do I really like about images that I make? I tend to like a more cooler shadow, and I like a little bit more of a warmer highlight. So one thing I can do is I can add a little bit of contrast first, because that's always going to be the strongest place to start, a little bit of contrast to my image. Whoops. And this one, I think I can, I didn't do any basic panel. I'm just going to pull up the shadows a little bit. So I emphasize this couple in the foreground. But pulling up the shadows here and also making this little bit of a tone curve, look at how that already makes it so much stronger. Got a little bit more contrast here. And then I can make my changes with my color channels. So I would love to tone down a little bit of the red in their faces. Again, I might do this in HSL, but I can do these changes in curves as well. And that's how these things overlap over and over. But remember, when you click on the curve and you pull it, it's going to do the whole photo at once. You have to actually add a second point to keep it from deviating from that center line on the entire image. So we're going to pull that down just a little bit. And we're going to make sure that the rest of the curve does not change that much. And here, I'm just going to make a minor change. And actually, I think they're more in the shadows. So while I thought they might be more in the highlights, let's pull down the shadows a little bit. We want less red here, so we're going to add a little bit cyan to counteract it. It's a little bit better. And then let's actually play with the green channel. I tend to do a lot with the green channel. I'm actually going to actually bring my shadows, the darker parts, to add more green into them. And I'm going to pull this entire part of the curve up. Notice how that adds a little bit more of a greenish hue to his shirt. I actually like what that's doing. That fits more of what I particularly enjoy here. All right, those are just some basic changes. I'm going to move down to my HSL panel because I can do some other things I like here. It's all going to layer on top of itself. I'm going to first pull the saturation of the sky down a little bit. That's a little bit much blue for me, a little bit too much. If I pull that down, look how it's getting a little bit more softer. And I can make some changes to the saturation of their skin tones as well. I think if I pull that down a little bit, making a little bit of a difference. Their skin is mostly maybe magenta, because that's not doing too much. Yeah, there we go. We've got a lot of magenta in their skin. So if I pull that down, it's going to make it a little bit stronger. And then look at what I can do with our luminance here. Again, I can bring their faces out with that red luminance, with that orange luminance. We're just increasing their presence. So minor changes, but look at what happens when we change that panel on and off. Obviously, the sky is a huge difference, uh, but we can see how this has made a huge difference here. OK, so another panel for you guys. And that is camera calibration. So down here at the bottom, we've got a panel called camera calibration. And it's just called calibration in Lightroom. Used to be called camera calibration. Um, but it will actually adjust those red, green, and blue channels as well. And a lot of people will actually use the ca calibration panel first thing when they get into Lightroom, because it can make sure that your color looks accurate 
in your photos right off the bat. And there's actually uh, different profiles that you can load or create for particular cameras. But in the way that I like to use it, I like to use it as a more like top layer thing, like a more stylistic part of my workflow because it can make minor changes that I might not have been able to make in other panels. So in calibration, I can actually pull my reds maybe a little bit closer to be an overall warmer tone. And that's going to look better to me on their faces and also I like what that does with her dress and I'm maybe going to play with increasing the saturation on them. So all of the reds in the photo, not just their faces and not just what Lightroom shows me to be red, but everything that might have a red tonality in it. And what's kind of interesting to think about here is red, green, and blue in the calibration panel are not like HSL, not in any way. And the reason for that is that red, green, and blue make up all of the colors in our photograph together. So they actually overlap a lot. So when we gra grab our blue primary down here, notice how if I change it enough, it actually affects much more than just the blue. It's affecting her hair, it's affecting the red of her dress, and it's actually, there are many colors that are made up of more blue. And this is gonna change that uh, entire set of colors as opposed to just what we think is blue, right? That's the difference between HSL and camera calibration. Camera calibration is actually just going to change that channel, which is uh, making up a portion of many colors in your photos, while uh, HSL is actually just going to change what you perceive to be those colors. So HSL is a little bit smarter. It doesn't uh, it doesn't count on uh, you to know what color is what color as much, but camera calibration, it's going to move more than just the color you think it's going to move for that reason. That's terrible. Let's get rid of that. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's do that on this photo here. Um, we've got these little leaves poking in from the top, and that bothers me. So let's pull that back. But on this photo, Camera calibration is going to be pretty useful for us because we've got a lot of blue poking in across our entire photo. And I actually want to make that a little bit more of a kind of cyan -y blue, and I don't want it to be as intense. So notice how overall this is affecting more than just blue, but mostly blue. I'm going to be able to desaturate some of those very bright, very obnoxious colors in the background that are distracting from my main subject. And I really like what this does. It makes it a little bit more uh, strong overall. I can also play with the greens, and those greens are going to change that grass quite a lot. They're also going to change her shirt, and they're also going to change her hair a little bit, because believe it or not, there's a lot of reflection coming up from that grass. And I think bringing it a little bit closer to the warm side makes it feel a little bit more springy, like it is. Maybe saturate that a little bit. Reds might do a little bit to her hair. I think maybe over there. Okay. So those are some minor changes. Let's turn it on and off. Let's see if we like what it did. Pretty subtle, right? But pretty good. Um, I like what it's done here. And that's something that you guys can consider because it's a pretty subtle change, but it ha makes a big difference. It makes a big impact overall on your photos. And sometimes if you can't get it with the other sliders, calibration can supply those little tiny color changes that you're trying to make in a way that the other sliders won't. Then, let me show you another one. So on this one, I have already done all of my other panels. I've already done everything else. I've done curves, I've done basic, I've done HSL, but I just couldn't get everything to pop and have quite the contrast that I'm looking for. It's close, but it's not perfect. And I can come down to camera calibration, and I think that this will do it for me. I want to have those little uh, orange things pop a little bit more. So I'm actually going to move them closer to that orangish side. Maybe not quite that much. And I'm going to increase the saturation. Let's bring out those reds. And I actually like what that does to her skin tone. It makes it a little bit stronger, a little bit more emphasized, a little bit cre cleaner. And then I can play with the green and see what that's going to do for me. I think actually bringing it closer to the blue side is pretty nice. Let's see. On the screen, it looks a little bit better on the yellow side, but it looks better on my screen on the blue side. So let's keep it over there. And then I'm going to desaturate those greens a little bit. I don't think they're as strong. And then blue, yeah, it changes a little bit. I think a little bit on the left. Okay, so let's turn this on and off. Subtle, right? 
but it makes a difference in her face and her arm and her skin tone quite a bit. And I like what it does with those little birds on the curtain. So sometimes you can get some nice changes from these panels. Okay, last panel I wanna show you guys. I'm actually gonna go to this photo right here. Let's say I wanna add all of my nice uh, edits to this photo. We'll do some simple photos. And we're almost done here. Um, simple photo changes. And I think my white balance is a little bit off. But let's get those done. Then let's say I want to add a little bit of a specific tonality to the shadows of my image. And I'm maybe not feeling brave enough to use curves, because curves can be a little crazy pretty quickly. And that's where split toning comes in. So split toning is a really interesting panel. It is actually essentially doing what curves does in the highlights and shadows mixed with what HSL does in the in the colors themselves. So it's kind of interesting. It's a different way to look at things. And what it's going to do is it's actually going to add a color to your highlights or add a color to your shadows. And this is pretty cool because it can actually uh, make a big difference in the overall look of your images. How many of you guys have worked with film and maybe made a cross-process effect in film where maybe you have a little bit more of a bluer highlight and a little bit more of a warmer shadow or vice versa? This is where that comes from. Uh, split toning was actually created from all the toning that we did in the darkroom. So that's pretty awesome. Um, any of those tones like selenium for black and whites or even sepia for black and whites, you can do those in split toning. You can add some tones to your highlights. But on color photos, I would recommend never changing the highlights because changing the highlights will tend to look pretty unnatural pretty quickly. Sometimes if you want to play with it, you could add a tiny bit of a warm tone. That's the only thing that might not look unrealistic, but I wish they would actually not let you add like magenta to your highlights or blue to your highlights because it starts to look pretty, uh, a little bit weird really fast. I'll show you an example. Let's say I wanted to add blue to my highlights. Look at that, that actually looks like the light itself was actually a very blue light, and we're outside, so that doesn't make any sense at all. Let's say I wanted it to be green. Whoa, even worse. So that looks like the light outside that was shining down on them is actually green. And because we're used to the sun, we want a daylight balanced or maybe a tiny bit of a warm highlight. Anything else looks a little bit weird and unrealistic. But this is really awesome when it comes to the shadows. So let's say I wanted to add a particular tone to the shadows. Let's say I wanted to warm them up. Let's say I really wanted a kind of reddish, kind of orangish undertone to my image. What I'm gonna do is I can move the hue slider and that's gonna set what color I'm going to add to that portion of the image. So on the shadow side, I'm gonna move the hue slider and I'm gonna put it on like an orangish hue. Then with saturation, I'm actually going to increase how much of that effect is being applied. So if I'm going to move up saturation, let's bring it up until I like it. Um, so a little bit of warmth. Now our shadows are actually warmer. We no longer have kind of that cool hue in the undertone of the image. We actually have a pretty warm image overall. Kind of interesting. Maybe I wanted to change it to a more cool hue and have kind of like a greenish or bluish undertone to my shadows. I just move the hue over to the greenish blue and then I can adjust my shadows here. So now it's a much more greenish blue hue on the shadows. Pretty interesting. So split toning is really cool. I totally recommend staying away from the highlight slider unless maybe a little bit of warmth but it can be very powerful in your shadows and it's a little bit more uh, gentle as opposed to curves so it can be a little bit softer and easier to use. Okay so I want to wrap it up by showing you what if we want to share this with uh, another photo. So let's say this is an example. I This was my opening slide. I really like the edits that I did on this picture. I think it came out pretty nicely. I did a lot in a lot of panels. Let's say I wanted to save it. I wanted to keep it for later. I wanted to make something that will be applied to another image. And I want it to be uh, usable. What I can do is I can create a preset. So over here on the left, you'll see your presets panel. And if I click the little plus sign, it'll say, do you want to add a new preset? And that's what I want to do. So click and create preset. So now all of that stuff that I've just done to this image, that uh, I've done curves, I've done HSL, I've done basic, I've done a lot of things. And all of those things I want to save so that I can try it on another photo as well. So to make a good preset, generally it's going to start by checking all of them for you. 
it's going to check every little possible thing you could have done in the develop panel. And that's awesome, but it's not really going to be effective in the long run. And the reason being is if I save these sliders and I apply them to another image that was taken in a different place that was taken at a different time of day with a different light source it's not going to be perfect every time so what I actually recommend is to always uncheck white balance always uncheck exposure always uncheck any local adjustments like graduated or rate radial filters and I'll also uncheck lens corrections and transform because those things are very specific to individual pictures and you're going to uh, be disappointed when you try to apply your preset to another image and it's not going to work. Um, and often it won't work perfectly even if you do these things, but this will help you get closer to the right thing because white balance and exposure are almost always different on every image and you're going to need to change them a little bit differently on every image. Beyond that, you're not going to want your local adjustments and your transform controls are going to be different depending on the lenses that you're using and everything else. Uh, you could also change uh, no, no, no noise reduction, but that can be a stylistic effect as well. So we can keep that one in. Um, but this is how you would save that preset. You give it a name, um, my preset looking good. You might want to give it a better name. I'm notoriously bad for naming presets. Maybe it should be something like uh, greenish shadows or something like that because that's a lot of what's going on in the photo. Uh, but you can name it something that you'll remember. That's the important part. Okay, so if I want to save this, I can hit create and then I can go to my next photo here. Let's actually reset this one that I was just playing with and I can see how it looks here. So I'm going to go to my preset and hey, it's adding a lot of those same tonalities that I was looking for. It's adding that like tealy color that I really love. And it's pretty close on all those other sliders. But remember, every single photo is going to have a different exposure and a different white balance. So I haven't done those adjustments yet. So I need to bring my exposure to where it looks good. I think much brighter. That's much better. So now I fix my exposure because that's going to be different on each picture. And then I'm going to change my white balance. This one looks better with a little bit more of a warm white balance. And now you can see that preset looks pretty good. You just also have to always do those individual photo things like in exposure and white balance. And you can see the difference here. If we go uh, Y to Y, let's see. Oop. All right, so that's before the preset and that's after the preset. And it did a pretty good job. Um, it looks much more similar to this image next to it. So. What's pretty cool about this is they both have that underlying teal tonality and a warm highlights. While they're in different locations, while they have different light sources, while there are a lot of things going on, it's going to look more consistent overall, right? Because I've figured out what I like and I've applied it to multiple images. So I encourage you guys to consider those things. Um, but last thing I want to show you guys is if we go back and we look at our PowerPoint here, I have some recommendations as you move forward. So those recommendations uh, go back to what I was talking about before we hopped into this. So we've talked about a lot of panels, we've talked about a lot of things, um, but what do we need to pay attention to as we're moving forward, as we're creating our style? And the first thing is I want you to actually do some research. First suggestion is pull together a collection of images that you actually wish you had taken. I really like the number 15, it works pretty well. Um, I've had our students do this over and over and it's a really fun process for them. It's actually very fun. Um, so I highly recommend you dig into it. Who doesn't want to look at more pictures every day, right? Um, so pull together a collection of images that you wish you had taken. 15 is a really good number, but try to make it exactly 15. No more, no less. That makes it even harder because then you have to actually be very intentional about what makes it into that number um, and study them carefully. What do you like about them? What lighting are they using? What colors are the strongest? what direction of light, what type of light source, uh, what composition are they using? Are most of them negative space? Are most of them center balanced like we talked about before? This can help you get closer to what you want. And next, take mental notes of the things that you do to your photos each time you edit. So that's why I asked you guys, what are the things that you're commonly doing? What are the things that you really find yourself loving in Lightroom? Those might be lending themselves to your particular style. So think about what they are and notice it. 
And then last, step away from your computer when you think you're done editing an image. Um, you'd be surprised how much this can help you overall when you're editing, because you might get to a point where you think, well, this is done, this is perfect. And then you walk away and you come back and you think, oh, what was I thinking? Um, and the benefit of this is that you can really consider whether it was uh, maybe too much editing or maybe too little. And often you've done too much um, and you might need to tone it down a little bit because we get a little a slider happy when we're working in Lightroom. It can be really fun. Um, so step away, come back. It really helps you overall. And then very, very last thing, Practice using other people's presets too. So you can buy presets online. You can download other people's free presets. There's so many places that you can see uh, where other people drag their sliders. So that's awesome. You download those presets, you install them in Lightroom, and you can actually see, oh, they added more green here. They added less blue here. That's what makes this effect. And you learn so much more about editing. So while you might not use that preset even on your picture, you learn so much about how it's working in the background. Background. And I cannot ex express the benefits of that anymore. Um, so you're going to improve over time, so don't be too hard on yourself, and be sure to revisit your images later. Uh, I really want you guys to experiment. Experimentation is key to developing the style that you really want. Um, so that's it. It takes a long time, but thank you guys. You're awesome.